so the next speaker in this session is Graham Stevens. He's the director of JPL Center for Climate Sciences, and the title of his talk is Physical Controls of the Earth's Climate and Climate Change. Hi, um, yes. Well, good afternoon. Yeah, I was asked to um, make a presentation on uh, you know, sort of the underlying physics that controls the Earth's climate, and um, basically what makes, what establishes the Earth's climate is the uh, processes that connect the flows of energy through the Earth's climate system uh, with the water that courses around it. And so the f what I'm going to sort of really cover in 30 minutes, a 30 minute sort of discussion on the climate, uh, the physics of climate, uh, we'll start with the energy balance of the planet um, I want to focus on some aspects that are rather curious about the energy balance of the planet, uh, leading into our, our um, understanding of um, climate change with this energy perspective, um, and lead into a connection between energy and water, and then back from water to energy and summarise. Now, as a disclaimer, um, I was asked to talk a little bit about, not so much about why we think the the physical processes of the climate system, why we think Earth is changing and the man's influence on climate change, but rather focus on the issues and the, 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 the science that, we, that are challenging, that we don't fully understand. So this will appear to be somewhat imbalanced towards what we don't know rather than what we do know. Um, and as such, because I also talk about climate change, it will, all, it will also, I'll also introduce some results from, you know, the climate models of the day, the most sophisticated of our Earth, Earth system models of today. And because I'm going to identify some remaining significant challenges in them, it might appear that I'm model bashing. And um, by all means, I'm not model bashing. Um, in fact, I actually work with the climate modelling uh, community to actually work and try to l and deal with some of their shortcomings and improve them. So it's going to be perhaps not a balanced talk in that way, but I want to sort of focus on some really rather interesting things about our climate systems that, we, that still puzzle us today and that we don't actually capture in our, these models that project climate change in the future. Just a word on climate models. Um, basic, uh, before I start, is the, um, the climate models have progressed dramatically in the last 20 or so years. 20 years ago, we had a very crude ocean atmosphere coupled models that represented our Earth climate system in a modeling context. And now these have become much, much more sophisticated with all, all sorts of components to them, such as add-in carbon cycles, uh, biospheric interactions, and so on. Um, the, bot the bottom um, left-hand panel there shows the uh, variety, each little entry in that little wheel. So it shows you a, um, individual climate model experiments that are accumulated for the IPCC activity. And here in this actually represents a real challenge for advancing modeling per se is that these assessments come along every about five years and there is an overwhelming increasing number of experiments that need to be run and actually the model development's been hampered so the models that, that are used for these assessments aren't necessarily the most sophisticated ones because they're tied up running a number of scenarios so i'm going to show you some results from some 20 what we call 20th century experiments um, I'm going to show you results of some observations, what the real, real system is doing, and to contrast against this. 20th century experiments are basically used to kind of calibrate the models and compare it with what we know about the real Earth system. I'm going to show you some results, but from the 1% per year experiments, because that tells us a little bit about the, um, what we expect to see as carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere. So these are models that are used for projections, although there are many different kinds of projections and rate of change of CO2 and other other forcing functions using these projections. And I'm going to show you some results from abrupt CO2 experiments. And these are typically used where you instantaneously increase the CO2 and watch the system meander back to an equilibrium. And that tells us something about the feedbacks. And that's how we have tried to estimate feedbacks. So what I thought I'd do is start with a kind of a very broad systems viewpoint of the Earth's climate system. This is a sort of viewpoint point that's sort of imprinted on the climate community thinking about how we analyze and think about the system's evolution and feedbacks. Uh, it's a very simplistic view, and in many ways, it's probably a, a fairly much inappropriate way of thinking about the interactions of a complex system. But this is the way it's sort of in, the, the imprint that we use today. 
And imagine you've got a, some input into a system. It's a solar input that has its own natural variability on top of uh, in, uh, in, uh, feeds into the system. And the system itself is the characteristics of the, of the system that defines the flows of energy in and out of it. And the output uh, typically is measured in terms of some, some metric. And the metric almost universally that's being used is the global mean temperature, which is not necessarily the most meaningful metric. Uh, you know, one could imagine you might think about a precipitation-related metric as more meaningful than a global mean temperature metric. Um, so the real, the, the, this is a simple system, but you know, this, the real earth system is one in which there's an action applied to it. That action is tr through a transfer is, uh, is imposes an impact, an impact on the radiation balance of the planet through radiative, what we call radiative forcing. That in turn drives the system um, and the output system. And then it, what we consider feedbacks are as processes that relate this output back into forcing the system and mod modify, modulate the forcing of the system. So the forcings that we consider are things like aerosol, changing of the building of the greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide shown there in those little panels. Um, and the output, as I said, is typically right now measured in terms of uh, global mean temperature. Um, and the consequences of this are then also a separate sort of study, such as sea level rise. Now, sea level is rising at about three and a half millimetres a year. About two thirds of that, we can estimate, is from mass buildup in the ocean from, from, uh, from, uh, from melting of the ice sheets, the principal ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. Um, about a third of it comes, of that sea level rise, we estimate, come from the swelling, the, the, the expansion of the ocean through warming. We sort of know this um, because we are able to measure independently the, al the altimetry from altimetry measurements to how this, the level of the oceans for the last 20 years. We now measure the gravity fluctuations around the planet, and which, inter which uh, are governed by the mass changes and principally by water changes. So we can work out, we can measure the mass changes of the oceans as a whole. And we, we indeed, we see the oceans warming um, at a rate that's consistent with all the projected warmings. Okay, so the energy balance. This is a kind of complicated view of the energy balance. It's our most up-to-date view of the energy balance. I'm going to just sort of walk around a little bit, uh, not focus on too many parts of this, but um, I'm going to think about the, um, all these quantities given here, all the numerical numbers and the uncertainties. These are all in, in, in fluxes of energy flowing in through the system in watts per meter squared. They're all meant to be um, annual, um, annual and global means. At the top of the atmosphere, we measure these, we measure these uh, energy inputs in and out of the system with um, instruments on orbiting satellites. And we've been doing this now for about, um, well, you know, through the mid-70s, but with more precision instruments from the mid-80s. Um, our uncertainty overall in terms of the sum of all of the fluxes in and out of the uh, atmosphere and just in the, me the broad measurements themselves is about four watts per meter squared. Um, I show you the top of the atmospheric imbalance there, and I quoted about 0.6 watts per meter squared. And one of the things that we're able to deduce from measurements of the heat gained in the ocean, like I just mentioned with the gravity and the altimetry measurements, or like from in situ measurements of, um, of temperature in the, in the oceans, is that the heat gained is of the order of about 0.6 watts per meter squared. And that the tracking of the radiation imbalance at the top of the atmosphere actually tracks the ocean heat content changes made independently within situ. So we think the precision of these top of the atmospheric measurements is, is, is um, significantly uh, better than what we quote here in terms of the overall measurement uncertainty that we can best estimate. So I want to talk a little bit about cloud effects. Um, the energy imbalance itself for 0.6 watts, because there's still issues there, we scratch our head over. And I'll talk a little bit about the reflected flux that you see from space of 100 watts. And that reflected flux is quite an important component of the energy balance of our planet, because it's, it's, the, it's modulations of that flux that we think are where many of the key feedbacks in the climate system sort of connect to. The surface energy balance, you look there, is a pretty grim state because, you know, we aren't able to measure this globally everywhere, so we have to infer it. And our process of inferring it from top, starting from the top and working our way down, adds more and more layers of uncertainty. You can see the uncertainties on these fluxes of the order of 10 watts per meter squared. So this is characterising the energy balance of our planet today. The sobering thing, of course, is the climate forcing that you might just ascribe to a simple measure of that forcing is doubling of CO2. 
uh, you know, it's a doubling at 1% gives a, 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 a doubling of CO2 in about 70 years. That forcing is about four watts at the top of the atmosphere and about one watt. So the CO2 forcing and the doubling metrics that are used to define climate sensitivities of that, of that order. So we have some real challenges here in terms of characterising the energy balance of the planet as a whole. And we, we, we're not entirely blind because obviously the surface energy balance that we're unable to really close from our, all of our individual estimates of the fluxes, that energy balance closure really again comes back to the oceans and the heat uptake by the oceans, which we're able to, we have much more precision at. So that's sort of at the very gross level a challenge for us. So let's talk about cloud effects, because one of the large uncertainties in the system, um, and to, as it evolves and changes, are the, are the feedbacks and clouds, and probably many of you probably heard about the uncertainties of feedbacks, and so why is it so complicated? Um, it's partly complicated because clouds, this is, why we, this is the way we begin to think about it as a sort of simple measure of the cloud effects on the flow of energy in and out of the planet. If we think about it, we can measure the radiation flowing in and out from an all sky point of view, and by sampling the planet under clear sky, we can come up with the equivalent of a hypothetical world that existed if there were no clouds. And the difference in the fluxes in and out of the top of the atmosphere and to and from the surface is a measure of what the clouds do to the, the energy balance of the planet. And so what, what, what of course happens is that clouds tend to be colder than the clearer atmosphere, and so they emit less radiation to space than the equivalent clear atmosphere. So they actually have their own greenhouse effects. So clouds have an, a greenhouse effect. So it's unlike CO2, which is primarily has only an effect on the infrared absorption and emission, and hence a greenhouse effect. Clouds have both a greenhouse effect of one sign, of course, and they also are bright and reflect sunlight, and they have what we call an albedo effect, on the other hand. And you can see in a global mean sense, the albedo effect of the of clouds is larger than the greenhouse effect. But the, the critical issue is, how do these influence change as the climate system is changing? Is which one is dominating? And nearly all of the cloud feedbacks in the system uh, are, are built around or, the, or, or sort of structured around the, the, an albedo effect being the dominant process. And so most of the cloud feedbacks are solar radiation based rather than thermal infrared based, but not all, but the majority of them. So um, the long and short wave effects tend to um, balance somewhat, uh, causing a kind of a complicating uh, influence on the Earth's energy balance. And this is sort of to the, the, to the simplest possible level, the complexity associated with the clouds. The second topic uh, in, relates to this figure, this figure of the energy balance is the um, ocean heat content uptake. And um, shown there is a scale of the ocean heat content from the 60s. There was a comment made just before the before Lonnie finished a uh, question to him, it, was, it wasn't a question, it was a statement about um, you know, the, Arctic, the, the oscillations of the atmosphere. And these are decadal type variability. What we've been able to observe in the ocean heat uptake uh, systematically well, over many decades is the oceans have been systematically warming. This is a fingerprint of warming, of the planet warming. Um, there are decadal variabilities in this, and there are about four or five different data records there. And as you go back, Beyond 70, um, beyond 1970, um, you know the data records thin, obviously because the oceans of observation are much less populated and the uncertainties swell. Um, but how much how much heat is actually accumulated in the ocean is a rather is a rather uh, still a debatable question that's going on within our community. Uh, this these in situ measurements. Uh, only measure the temperature profile and hence the heat content of the ocean in the upper 700 meters. And there's a debate, a real debate, is about how much heat is being trapped, being pulled down and trapped into the deeper ocean. And there really isn't an agreement on this. There's, a, what, there's two sides of the argument on this. And this, I'm just showing you the other side of the argument. This is actually from a, a very, very recent ocean reanalysis. Um, and reanalysis means in the climate, com, climate, climate community, it's a basically an Earth system model that ingests in it all the observations it has and it assimilates these observations and gives you the best estimate, model estimate, projection mapped to or fitted to the observations. And it's a variety of observations. In this reanalysis, an enormous amount of observations, which I won't have time to talk about. But the bottom line is there is that blue middle curve is a 700 metre, according to this reanalysis of mount heat content in the first 700 metres, 
the upper purple curve is the amount of heat content in the entire ocean. And so they are arguing in this reanalysis that some 30% of the total heat is down below 700 meters. So this is still a debate. This is not any, by any means accepted. And you can see as a calibration, this is these, these quantities are in joules. You can see as a calibration that dashed line and that, uh, right, that right hand figure as you see it. Um, that dashed line represents, the slope of these represents the, uh, this heat in watts per meter squared. So this reanalysis says the ocean heat up takes about one watt per meter squared, not the 0.6 that I showed you in that figure. So there's a debate and we don't really kind of know the full answer. So uh, that's what proportion of change takes place in the deeper ocean. Something I haven't shown here, but the, the oceans have continually, according to these time series, continually build up in heat. Yet in the last 20 years, the, planet, the warming of the planet hasn't been nearly what it was in the 20 years before, the last 15 years or 15 years before. And so how, and the interesting thing is, the climate models are projecting a warming that's a little higher than what we've experienced in the last 15 years. So we, we have a puzzle here. We don't quite know why the oceans are continually warming. The surface temp of the oceans aren't, but the deeper oceans are continually warming. How's that occurring? Um, uh, how's this occurring uh, where the um, surface is not showing the same degree of warming as it's occurring below it? So we still have questions. We're still wondering about how the heat's really getting into the ocean, and what's the real mechanisms, and, and so on. Um, this reflected sunlight, is, as I said, is, is rather remarkable for our planet, unless I find it remark rather remarkable. But we have data now collected that allows us to sort of unpeel the onion and kind of figure out how much of the reflected sunlight that we measure leaving the planet comes from processes that scatter in the atmosphere and processes that relate to reflection off the surface of the, of, of the Earth. And that's sort of shown in that diagram, those bar diagrams, watts per meter squared, about 100 watts is reflected in total. About 90 of that's coming from the atmosphere and around 10 or, or a little bit more is coming from the surface. Of course, that's, clouds obscure the surface, so clouds are the pr primary source of that reflection. They obscure the surface somewhat, so um, the surface under clear, purely clear conditions reflects a lot more than that 10 watts. But what's remarkable, if you look at the two hemispheres, now the two hemispheres of our planet look very different. You know, one's much more land mass than the other, and you would expect a priori that um, the dis dis disposition of, of reflected energy might be quite different between the two hemispheres. And in fact, it's actually not. In fact, the hemispheric difference you see there on the left-hand bar of that lower panel is basically zero, as far as we can measure. The two hemispheres are purely pure symmetric in terms of the energy reflected to space. And we don't quite understand why that would be. Uh, what we do know is that the clouds of the southern hemisphere offset the increased land mass of the northern hemisphere. Why is this the case? Um, what we also know is that the climate models in the 20th century run, it's shown here, this shows, shows the same hemispheric difference of the models. Um, most of them don't show this hemispheric symmetry. Question is, is this important? And we're still trying to figure this out. But the implications are that it has, has quite profound influence on how heat is transported from low latitudes to high latitudes and the amount of heat. In the natural system, that is purely symmetric about the equator. In some of these models, there's a, dis there's a disproportional difference in the um, heat transported from equator to pole. So this is something we still we don't understand. Um, the other aspect of the solar energy reflected to space is the year-to-year -year variability is incredibly small. The right-hand panel there, which I think I show here as a highlight there is from measurements, is tiny. This is in watts per meter squared. Um, the interannual variability, that is one year to another to another. This is only over the 10 year, 11 years of series observations, unfortunately, um, um, show a, a, an interannual variability that's four times below what the climate models show. And this is important because, as I said, the main climate feedbacks we, uh, are mostly influenced, we think, the solar part of the balance of the system. Um, it appears that nature is really buffered, it's really robust against change, where the models are too, too, uh, too responsive to change. And this is kind of a theme I'm going to highlight you know, later, right at the end of the talk, if, I, if I've got time. Um, Okay, so let's now think about energy balance under simulated climate change. And, and in this, I'm going to just show you some snapshots from the 1% CMIP5 experiments. Um, and basically, the changes in energy, this energy balance associated with a buildup of greenhouse gases, this 
in this case, are qu really quite small. I've already hinted at what the sort of magnitude of the forcings are. These are really quite small. And the relationship between those fluxes of energy and the mean surface temperature change, delta F is proportional to delta T, is pretty linear. And there's an example of this shows the, how much the emission of radiation from the atmosphere, the surface is changing as the planet's warming in this, in this simulated world. And it's very, very linear. I won't explain all the difference between the curves, but it's basically linear. And it turns out this flux of energy emitted from the atmosphere to the surface, these are single largest change that occurs in the higher energy balance of the planet through associated with the buildup of CO2. And that single most change is actually driven by water and water vapour. And that's hence the, what we refer to as water vapour feedback, which I'll get to. So, so it's because these responses are linear, we can look at this as a sensitivity. And, and I'm, I'm going to come back, I'm not going to dwell on this a lot, but, uh, but I'm going to come back to the bottom figure. It just shows you the magnitudes of the changes of these fluxes that set up the energy balance of the planet at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface. And I'm going to pack, come back to the surface when you can see there are two large terms that sort of set the balance in, in the climate change scenario. Um, one has to do with the water cycle, one has to do with the energy balance of the planet. Um, so the net difference, um, the surface response is largely um, a result of these two, I think we've got the, these two components there. One is from the long wave radiation emitted from the atmosphere to the surface. This is controlled by water vapour buildup and uh, as the planet warms. The other is the increase of latent heat, um, which is an expression of the enhanced hydrological cycle increased precipitation. So you can equate the um, latent heat increase, negative because it's leaving the surface, um, as associated with increased precipitation, directly proportional to actually precipitation. And so the surface energy balance in climate change is set by those two processes. And so there you can start to see why the water cycle is controlled by the energy cycle in, in, in the climate system. Is as you perturb the energy cycle, it in turn feeds in and filters through this connection that's perturbing the water cycle. Now, in climate sensitivity and feedbacks, and I'm just going to go through the methodologies that the community uses, and these are over, overly simplistic, and they're actually sort of somewhat empirical, and the Earth system, climate systems are more complex than this, and this is part of the problem with why we have ambiguities in understanding feedbacks, in my, in my view. So imagine we have the net... Flux at the top of the atmosphere, um, energy flowing in and out of the atmosphere. One part's the absorbed solar, that's the net of solar in and not solar out. The other part is the emitted long wave out to space. And we can always break this down. I didn't emphasize this in the previous view group. We can always break down each part of this as a part that's due to the clear sky and a part that's due to the difference between clear sky and the old sky that we would observe. And that difference between the clear sky and the old sky is what this, is this cloud radiating effect I mentioned. So we can always break down each component to have a clear, clear sky component minus the cloud radiative effect is how we define it. Anyway, so what we do is we postulate that there's a linear, that, that the net flux, the energy flowing in the system can be broken into a part that's sort of constant, independent of temperature, and a part that's temperature dependent. And this is quite empirical, of course, because you can imagine the flows of energy in our system aren't just simply temperature dependent. They're a function of, you know, the scatterers, the amount of ga different amounts of gases, uh, the heights of the gases, all the things that, that would make, make them other than just mean temperature related. But this is this framework in which we, we, can, we try to identify what we mean by climate forcing and climate feedbacks. So imagine that we postulate such a change. I'm going to show you an example of the twice CO2 experiment where you double CO2 and just let the model adjust back to an equilibrium, and that's shown in this diagram. And so you see the net flux change, you instantaneously double CO2, and you watch it waddle back to equilibrium. And basically what you have is where, where, the, where delta T is zero, that's the instantaneous, time of instantaneous increase of CO2, that's what defines what the so-called radiative forcing. So in this doubling of CO2, just like I mentioned, is about four watts. Five minutes, yeah. Um, the slope gives total feedback, um, that alpha gives you the total feedback of the system. And the, uh, at, at the, when the net flux is zero, that's back to its equilibrium, and that's what we call climate sensitivity. And the different slopes imply different strengths of feedbacks. Right? So the, this alpha is taken in this simple analysis as a measure of the strength of the feedbacks. 
Now, what how often you don't see when you look at climate, projected climate temperature, uh, temperature changes, what you often you don't see is that, that the, model, the climate sensitivity, that is how much the planet is projected to warm as CO2 is doubled, is the magnitude of that climate sensitivity. You can see there's a range of the models run from 2 to, two to 4.5 degrees. Uh, the, 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 the mean climate state, which is the y-axis, is about the same magnitude. So representing the mean climate state, uh, we have significant challenges still in representing the mean climate state uh, as we deal with climate change. These are challenges still that, that remain. And the feedbacks themselves, the main feedbacks are a temperature feedback. Well, that's just simply, uh, you know, a warmer, a, a, warmer, a warmer atmosphere with emitting gas will emit more radiation than a colder atmosphere. That's just a simple, what is often referred to as a Planck feedback. Um, water vapour feedback, albedo feedbacks and cloud related feedbacks. They're the four principal feedbacks in the system. That bar that you see, the sum of the feedbacks is the yellow big bar and each feedback independently based on some analysis of some colleagues have done, uh, the coloured coloured ones as you can see. But the bar actually represents the range of uncertainty in the feedbacks and it turns out that almost all these feedback, uncertainties and feedbacks are due to um, clouds. The y-axis represents uh, and the cloud component to that feedback, and the x-axis represents a net total feedback. So the majority of the uncertainty of feedbacks revolve around cloud. Okay, water vapour feedback. Uh, quickly skim, uh, skip over this, and I'll get to some of the final topic. I'm going to skip over a couple of topics since I've only got a few minutes. Um, water vapour feedback. One of the key parameters that characterises the water vapour feedback is the total amount of water in the atmospheric column, and that's this W, uh, that's this w um, parameter. It relates the vertical integral of mass mixing ratio. It connects to, it basically connects to temperature through the clausius clapeyron relationship and relative humidity. And what we find is that the projected change in water vapour and even the observed changes of water vapour we've seen over the last 20 years or so map pretty tightly to what you would project just from clausius clapeyron arguments alone with the amount of warming we've seen. And what this basically implies is that the relative humidity of the system inside the system is fixed, it hasn't changed. And we actually don't know why that would be the case. We don't know why the relative humidity ought to be fixed in a warming world. In fact, in many arguments argue that it ought not be fixed. So the water vapor feedback is simply warmer, is larger, larger amounts of water, more emission, stronger greenhouse effect, more warming. That's sort of the simplistic arguments. But the, water, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is quite fundamental. Um, I'm going to skip, I might skip over these next couple of you guys because they're a little bit de detailed. Um, let me get to the precipitation, some aspects of precipitation. Um, the the amount of, total amount of precipitation that falls out of the sky averaged over a year or averaged over you know, a large period of time which you consider climate, that's actually constrained by the energy balance. And I showed you those diagrams where the energy, where the radiation the radiation at the surface, the radiation change at the surface and the latent heat change at the surface sort of match. This is constrained by energy and most of the climate models actually get this accumulated precipitation pretty well because it's any constrained and the models actually represent the energy budget of the planet pretty well. Um, but what really matters from a societal point of view is not so much what the total amount is accumulated over some period of time, although that has some obvious societal importance, but how often does it rain and how intense is it, is it, does it rain? Because the frequency and the intensity point directly to things like flooding and you know, prolonged periods of dryness and drought. And it points to things like how water runs through the system, runoff uh, into, the, into the rivers and the oceans. And what we find here, and this is a figure, and it's probably hard to see at the back, but I just sort of, sort of speak my way through it. It shows you the, the, the frequency of precipitation that we can now measure around the world. We're now in the last 10 years have been able to make some definitive statements about global precipitation actually. It's how often does it rain, for example. We didn't know this until about 10 years ago. Um, and basically the, the, plan, the, the models of the, the, the model systems, both our we advanced weather models and our advanced climate models, Make rain about you know 30 to 50 percent of uh, 30 to between 30 and 100 percent too often. All models, even sophisticated models with really advanced precipitation physics, they make drizzle. The, the planet wants to drizzle all the time rather than rain. Big. This is a big issue actually. And so I wrote this paper on the dreary state of precipitation global models, and it's not much different today. Uh, but we're working in it. We think we understand why this is the case. 
Uh, so while empirical observations uh, evidence suggests that storms locally increase in intensity through increased water supply, we can't make this broad inference from present day models, which is one of our tools we use in our research, because they don't get the character of the rain correct. They get the accumulated. Just two more and we could wrap it up. Is that one minute? Okay. Um, let me talk about aerosol effects just briefly and wrap before I wrap this up. This is a picture of ships sailing through the under marine layers of clouds and the effluence of ships, the aerosols are from ships um, into, uh, find themselves in the clouds, they act as cloud nuclei and the, the microphysics of clouds change and clouds brighten. And so this is called the aerosol indirect effect. And the idea is, is that aerosol in the cloud, the clouds have copious amounts of nuclei, lots of droplets now rather than few droplets. They're small, they scatter more efficiently, they reflect more sunlight. But nature's a little more complicated than this. Um, smaller drops also mean reduced drizzle. That means more water in the clouds, means greater cloud cover, and that means a larger aerosol indirect effect. Smaller droplets, on the other hand, means the droplets are smaller and you get much more enhanced evaporation of the drops, which means it reduces the water. So you've got these two things going on in nature, competing against each other. It's not clear that the aerosol indirect effect is necessarily um, indeed strong, and most of the models have this as rather strong. So why does this matter? Well, this really matters. This is an example of, of, of observations of the, of the historical record from 1860 and three climate model experiments from the GFDL model. The three models, one has excessive drizzle, such as in the dreary world. One's a very damp model still, it has too much drizzle. And one is closer to the real world in drizzle. And it turns out the one that closest to the world in real drizzle doesn't look like the real world. And that basically means that there are processes in nature that, that limit this aerosol indirect effect. The differences in these experiments, by the way, I should have mentioned, is that it's only the way drizzle is turned on or off in the model. It's just one little lever in the model that turns drizzle on and off. And you can see the evolution of the warming is totally different in the model. And the response of the model is very, very non, very, very non-linear, where you get enhanced albedo feedback. So I'm going to go with that. So summarise. OK, so principal controls of climate are energy. The most dominant processes of those responsible, uh, are the responsible feedbacks involve the water cycle. Um, many aspects of these feedbacks require much more understanding, such as water vapour uh, feedbacks and relative humidity issues, clouds, aerosol connections to clouds and so on. Our measures of feedbacks are grossly simplistic, as I mentioned. And in the water cycle, the global water global precipitation changes are actually set by total water vapour changes through the effects on energy balance. Um, uh, but we don't know, in terms of the water cycle, we really don't know today how much of the water cycle change is predictable. We don't know uh, on a regional scale how the precipitation is going to really change. Over land, there are still major challenges for us in representing precipitation. Um, and the details of how the water cycle changes, unfortunately, are very sensitive to the resolution of models. And we're not required at the resolution where we actually resolve the physical processes, the moist physical processes adequately enough. So thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, time for one or two questions. Uh, yes. Oh yes, in fact, absolutely critical. Um, you can, there's different ways you can measure the strength of the greenhouse. You know, from a physical point of view, can you relate to the opacity of the atmosphere? And 75% of the opacity of the atmosphere, global mean, is water vapor. So 75% of the planet's greenhouse effect is water vapor. So water vapor, water sets the pace of climate change. CO2 is the catalyst. Uh, another question here. Repeat the question. Yeah, uh, he wants to, when you translate the uncertainty, in the, uh, certainly I've sort of characterised in terms of the models to the uncertainty in the anthropogenic warming. Okay, the, a simple way to think about this is as follows. Uh, the Planck feedback that I mentioned is fairly, fairly, fairly unequivocal. That gives you about a one degree f of war for, for increasing the CO2, that gives you about a one degree of, of warming over and above initial amount of CO2. So the warming has to be at least one degree. CO2 itself is a fraction of a degree, so it's at least one degree. So the other water vapour feedback, you know, water vapour feedback we think is unequivocally positive. 
you have to have this pretty, pretty bizarre arguments to argue it's negative. But you know there are some arguments out there, by the way, that is negative. So water vapor feedback is possibly positive. And this is why you get to a lower limit of about two degrees in models of warming. The upper, the upper range is they have all sorts of positive feedbacks. Most models have all the cloud feedbacks in the models are positive. I'm not so convinced that's the case, but all the model feedbacks are positive. So you can see it drives the, there are feedbacks in the models that push it positive beyond two degrees. But two degrees is what you would get with plank and water vapor feedbacks. Now you could argue water vapor feedbacks might not be positive, but it's going to be a tougher argument because all the, all the empirical evidence shows that water vapor continually builds the plant warms. So let's thank Graham for a beautiful talk.